real success stories told by the people who live them. We're going to have some guests on this show that everybody knows, and we're going to have guests on this show that nobody knows yet. One by one, Nick Heider is adding hits to the hit streak. Blessings, folks. Welcome back to another episode of the hit streak. I am your man, Nick Heider, and uh, folks, we're getting right into it today. I've got an unbelievable episode for you today. Check out my guest, guys. You all know him. You've all heard him. He's the PA announcer for the Tennessee Titans. He's a TV show personality. He's a business owner, a motivational speaker, and the founder of BringHeaven.us. My dude, Matt Rogers, Let's is in the go! building. Oh, come on, baby. Hey, I like that introduction. Thank you so much. You said... uh you're not going to believe what we have here. So unbelievable. I like that. I'm in. That's right, baby. Let's get this hit streak going. We got lots to talk about today. We got lots to talk about today. So let's tell the folks real quick. So obviously, I met you for the first time not that long ago um, at a at a Christmas party from a mutual friend of ours, the real Brad yes. Lee. <laughs> we were having these mocktails with his wife did a good job of like making that party unbelievable with like real strawberries in your drink and it just was awesome. So met you for the first time, and uh, you smelled good back then, and you smell fantastic today too. So you're on the hit streak, two for two. That's right. You're smelling like heaven, baby. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, dude, um, you know when I, I so literally like one of the first things I ever heard out of your mouth was when Brad basically just said, "Hey, you know Matt believes Matt believes in miracles. Tell some <laughs> stories." You know that was a, you know hey that's something like you got to be like ready for your moment because I mean I'm sitting around with. You and Bradley, and there's, you know, like big business, multi-millionaires there, it was right? A, it was a room. It was a room. And when I'm in rooms like that, I listen. I don't talk because I know that, you know, there's people I can get some stuff from, like knowledge-wise. So we're just sitting there, and Brad's smoking his cigar, and he goes, you know, Matt's a man of faith. He believes in miracles. Matt, why don't you tell everybody about that? <laughs> Okay, like and so, but I like that's my passion. I love that stuff because I mean, like at a young age, uh, I just saw crazy miracles. Like, you know, Jesus didn't just become my savior; he became my healer. Mm. And you know, I'm 45 years old now, so in the last 40 years, I mean, I've seen. So when you say unbelievable, like I've seen unbelievable. I've seen people who are supposed to die live, kids come out of coma, deaf girls pull their hearing aids out of their ears, like me. Mm. You know, I was never supposed to get my heart rate above 100. You know, doctors told my mom he's never going to play sports. He's never going to do this. I had alligator skin, bloodshot eyes, sores all over my mouth. My fingernails and toenails were falling off. And my mom said, well, it doesn't matter what you say. My Jesus is going to heal him. Mm. So, like, at a young age, Jesus wasn't a religious figure to me. Jesus was a freaking boss mm. that healed me and That's that right. gave me my life back. So, and he hasn't changed. So, I'm, I'm ready to talk about that. Absolutely. Anytime. Absolutely. Well, well, folks, check it out. You know, in uh, in 2001, you helped lead uh, your team, the Washington Huskies, to a Rose Bowl victory. Yes. Dude, that's um, that's about as big of a stage as it gets in sports. It was cool, man. I was 340 pounds back then. This is me skinny. So <laughs> uh, I know the camera adds 40 pounds, but uh, no, but yeah, it was, it was awesome. And the crazy thing about that was too, like, if you visit me, as a freshman high school football player, I was chubby, soft, slow. I played one play my freshman year. Mm. But, like, I had a very encouraging mother. Like you said, like, you know, I brag about my mom all the time. And she would just always tell me how great I was when everyone else told me how crappy I was. And, you know, whatever voice you come into agreement with, that's what you'll become. Mm. So I didn't let what I was experiencing determine what was being spoken over me and then you fast forward eight years and it's like wait a minute dude that guy won a freaking rose bowl that's right like how did that happen so i mean it it really is true like i was a zero my freshman year and then i ended up being a junior college kid i went to citrus junior college go owls mm. but i had zero offers out of high school and then in 18 months after my sophomore year of playing football i had 47 d1 offers let's go like the light went on and i honestly man it was because i had a good coach mm. that pulled it out of me which you know and that's why i love being here with you and being in that room with those guys like who you surround yourself with is what 
you'll become. And it really didn't hit for me until junior college. So that's right. That's I had a right. coach that pulled it out of me when I had a bunch of other coaches that told me how crappy I was. And, oh, you'll never do this. You'll never do that. But I'm telling you, one coach was like, you can do this. I can help you this. And I believe him. And mm. 18 months, you know what I mean? It's not like I didn't get stronger. When I graduated uh, from Citrus Junior College and I got my D1 scholarship, I was bench pressing as an offensive lineman 245 pounds. Okay. I was not strong. Right. I never put up two plates in high school. So it was like I I hadn't even really developed yet, but mm. he found my strength, which was my fast feet, and he built off of that. And then by the time I graduated University of Washington, I was, you know, benching four thirty five, I think. And mm. so it was always there. I just needed the right person to pull it out of me. Mm. In that, like, th- seriously, that's the moral of the whole story, isn't it, right? Like, that's what we're all searching for. Totally. You know what I mean? That's what we're all searching for. Um, all right, so after after the Rose Bowl, we're just going to kind of abbreviate um, the story a little bit to get to the real meat and potatoes here, right? So after after the Rose Bowl, um, talk to me a little bit about what happened after that. I know I struggled after I was done with baseball when I retired at 27 years old. Yeah. I realized I actually didn't know who I was if I wasn't a baseball player. And it took, I mean, I struggled with that for about 10 years, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? So talk to me a little bit about um, as you're shifting, uh, your, literally your identity. Very similar story to what you just said, because I was supposed to get drafted in between rounds three and five. So I wasn't a you know top draft pick, but I definitely wasn't a scrub. So I was supposed to get drafted probably rounds three to five, maybe six. So I'm sitting, I'll never this, get this again, back to my mom. You got to understand, and I'm, you know, giving you all the, the cliff notes version, but she was a powerful woman of God that heard from heaven. Like I would sit in restaurants with her and she would pray and prophesy over people. And I would watch like heaven show up. Like she always taught me like heaven's not closed. Like when Jesus was baptized, heaven opened up, God spoke and it never closed again. Like we're operating under an open heaven. Mm. So when you see that stuff and you're not experiencing that, it gets frustrating. So I'll never forget before the draft, my mom said to me, I just want you to know, sweetheart, that God has bigger plans for you than football. And I don't want you to set your heart on football. And I mean, you hit the hit streak, you know, sound, but for me, that was like someone punched me in the stomach because you know, like mm-hmm. I've had coaches tell me I wasn't going to do stuff. But when mom said this ain't going to happen, I knew it probably wasn't going to happen. And I was mad mm-hmm. because all I ever knew out my whole identity, like you said, you with baseball was me and football. I wasn't a good student. I wasn't smart. I graduated with a 1.96. All I did in college was play football, drink beer and party. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't nowadays. Student athletes are just way more polished than we are no doubt yeah like good grades are cool now to back then it's like oh what a freaking nerd you got a 2.5 you need to practice football more so i remember sitting in that chair in seattle washington by myself and the lazy boy watching guys that i dominated get drafted before me Mm. and it was the first time i literally like cried my eyes out by myself i was mad at god i was mad at my mom i was mad at life I got a free agency. I got picked up by the Cincinnati Bengals. I was there for like a day and a half and got cut. It was almost like my, you know, God said, Hey, I got bigger things for you. And it was just like, well, you're a liar because this is what it was. Yeah. And it wasn't happening. And after I got cut by the Bengals, like the Dolphins and the Niners called and said, You want to go there? My agent said, You want to come here? I said, No. Like, because I knew it wasn't for me and it wasn't going to happen. Um, And I'm trying to say that in like a positive way. Like I was depressed, but I had to trust that God had bigger things for me. And I saw that at a young age to where I built that trust, even though I wasn't seeing it. Because the truth is I went from winning a Rose Bowl, walking into places and everyone knew my name to moving back home to California, making a thousand dollars a month, calling people to ask them if they wanted to refinance. (laughs) And I was living with my parents. Yeah. And it freaking sucked. It's like, um, it was wh- terrible. So, but you, so you, you retired on your own terms. You finished on your own terms. I did too, right? I realized um, my story is kind of similar. Um, do, I have like a, a little bit of a rare ner- nerve disorder that no, that 
nobody would ever know I had it except for one time when it surfaced and, and over t- took about six weeks, but I had to learn to walk again as a sophomore in college. Wow. So from that moment on, whether I was good enough or not, I was no longer a draft draftable person. I did sign as a free agent. Um, a wonderful man named Fred Ferrara with the Mar- uh, Marlins and Expos organization gave me a shot. And uh, I, I bounced around five years in the minor leagues, got treated great. And um, But uh, first of all, I realized all I ever wanted to do was play professional baseball, and I did that. I never said I wanted to be the catcher for the Yankees, so I didn't know how to dream yet, right? My goal setting was too vague. I accomplished everything I wanted to do. And after after five years, technically six, I got tired of being broke, got tired of being on the road nine months out of the year, and I realized that I was finished. So I didn't quit. I finished, yeah. right? Quitters and finishers, they're, they look and smell the same, right? But if you, you know, beginnings hide themselves in ends, and if you quit, it's not the beginning of something else, but if you finish, it is. That's a good word right there. Hey, you should give yourself a hit streak. Boom. There you go. Um, but you finished. And and um, back then... By the way, thank you. No one's ever said that to me before and explained it. So I just it. felt that hit with me. Dude, you finished. Thank like, you. you know what I mean? That was it. It was on your terms, right? Yeah. So, um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but... Um, when uh, back then I listened, uh, I was I was a man of faith, but I was struggling with it. I didn't know how to pray. I hadn't learned how to pray yet, I, and and I listened, but I only listened to the parts I liked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I had a filter, a filtration system on there that wasn't working very good, and um, but I, that was how I knew that I needed to move on to the next thing. And it opened, and again, it opened the door to something else. That's at where I went eventually on to meet my wife, work together, um, learned a lot. Figured out that I couldn't be the man I needed to be there and, and, and go on to the next thing, which, um, again, it was about a 10-year journey from baseball to, like, Nick, that's Nick Heider. Yeah. that You know, that that's Nick Heider, not the baseball guy, just that's Nick Heider, right? To figure out who in the heck I was, and and, and it's still a work in progress, obviously, right? So, um, all right, so you've uh, you got done with uh, – with you've, you've, you're done with the NFL, and it's time, yeah. to, it's time to go next. How long of a gap was it before – did you bounce around – um, before you really found your, you know, the rubber met the road. Yeah. I, d- I didn't bounce around. I knew like you, I wanted to make money. Like all college kids, all kids like, I want to make bank, bro. That's right? right. You know what I mean? Like I want to make money. So, uh, the university of Washington was phenomenal in helping their student athletes get a job. So I thought I was going to go work for Gallo wine and be a wine rep. And you know, I was going to make 40 grand a year company car, this and that, like that was mm-hmm. awesome. And I went through this whole interview process and I got the job. So I knew, and my brother told me, which my older brother, I love him to death, my boy Tim. He told me, Matt, if you want to be wealthy, you have to either sell something or you have to invent something. And I'm like, well, I can't invent nothing. Mm. So you need to get in sales. You got to sell something. So I knew I wanted to be in sales. And um, so I got the job, beat everyone out. And right as I was about to take it, my buddy, Danian, that I played high school football with, he was doing mortgages and he goes, bro, we're killing this mortgage thing. Why don't you come home and work for me and my brother's company? And I trusted him because he was my buddy. And that's when I went home and I was making a thousand dollars a month mm. as a telemarketer in 2001 calling you saying, Hey Nick, interest rates are at an all time low. Have you thought about refinancing? I did that all day. Mm-hmm. So I'd get the leads and I'd give it to the mortgage loan officers. And then I would make nothing and I would watch them make bank so i'm like okay well i want to do that so i got my real estate license and then when i got licensed that's when i started doing mortgages met my wife who was a processor at the time we joined forces and then we just exploded in 2003 bam that's what i'm talking about how in the world did you get into so obviously um you know into into uh i don't know the world of hollywood through um uh through nfl uh being being um the p announcer for the titans you were on american idol you've done some stuff with discovery channel hallmark and nbc yeah. uh walk us into that and uh and that kind of brings us to where we are today and and what the future holds right so. yeah you know i mean and again I, i'm trying not to sound too preachy but it just comes out of me but the truth is and i know people are listening like you never know when god has your moment set for you Mm -hmm. like he's orchestrating behind the scenes like heaven's talking about you behind your back whether you believe it or not Mm. and so i was at a mortgage thing for like the top five guys and the boss was there and we never really saw him that much and he was like you know drinking and stuff and rumor around the table was like hey rogers can sing opera so 
He was like, I'll give you 500 bucks if you stand up in front of this restaurant and sing opera. And it was a nice restaurant. It was the Palms in San Diego. And they serve you the food and open the tin. And they got the white towel like this. <laughs> so if you were to stand up and make some noise, people would be like, what are you doing? But I said, let's go. And I stood up in front of the whole restaurant. I went, Riva, Riso, Riva. And I just started freaking singing. <laughs> and dude, everyone stops and kind of looks. And then at the very end, it was like 20 seconds. I thought, oh, you're right. And like, one clap turns into, and the whole restaurant stands up like the cooks are looking behind the kitchen. The piano player stops. And dude, it was just a cool, funny moment. I'm laughing. And this guy comes up to me. He goes, hello, mate. My name is Nigel Lithgow. I have a show called American Idol. You might have heard of it. I think you should try out. We're having auditions at the Rose Bowl. What? The Rose Bowl? I've been there before. Uh-huh. He goes, in a couple weeks, you should try out. And then on top of that, my buddy who worked at the mortgage place knew one of the security guards at Idol, and I went and I slept. Not that that mattered, and it was just all kind of tied together. And I went and I auditioned for Idol, and then got to be one of the finalists. And when I got voted off Idol, Ryan Seacrest and Simon Cowell were very good to me, and they said, "Well, what do you want to do? How can we help you?" And I said, "I don't want to." Like I'm looking at Fantasia. Diana DeGarmo, Jennifer Hudson. Previous guest, Diana DeGarmo. Really? On the, on the hit She's street. awesome. With Her a- and Ace. With yeah. Ace, they're best friends of ours, man. Yeah. Absolutely. She sang at me and my wife's wedding. Yeah. As out. my wife was walking down the aisle, Diana DeGarmo sang, From This Moment by Shania Twain. Mm. So anyway, I'm like, well, I can't do that. Like, they're phenomenal. Yeah. I said, but I want to host TV shows. Like, I like making people laugh. I like do what you and I are doing. Like, I love this. Mm-hmm. And... Seacrest said, okay, I'll give you a correspondent on my show on air with Ryan Seacrest. And then as you know, you treat people right and you show up and you do what you say, good things will just lucky or magically happen, right? We call it the favor of the Lord. Like mm-hmm. if you are diligent and everything, if God gives you the small things and you're good at that, he'll give you the big things. So from there, I met a producer on the show that, was with Discovery Channel. And then I got my first show on Discovery Channel called Really Big Things with Matt Rogers. Mm. And then I hosted a show called Coming Home on Lifetime where we brought home soldiers. And then I hosted Deadliest Catch and Gold Rush. So I have a really good relationship with Discovery Channel. They have been great to me for 20 years. Mm. And let's go. Yeah. So it's just, that's kind of how it happened. Like, and I'll never forget, dude, when I was on Idol, not to say anything bad about the other contestants or anything, because they're all great people, but a lot of people think they've arrived like, Hey, congratulations. I'm here. And I learned that in football. Like you treat the equipment manager the same as you treat your head coach and the president of the school. And I just never forget. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but I'm trying more to give people a tip out there. Like the PAs or the production assistants that got us our, you know, craft, our Skittles and our, you know, broccoli that dipped in the ranch like they're the ones put that together i just remember treating them like gold in five years and other people treat them like crap yep and five years later i'm sitting across the table from them asking them for a job and they end up being my boss look at that and it was just so and they always say like i never forget the way you treated people and the way you made people feel you know Mm. because we've all heard like People will forget what you say. People forget what you do, but they'll never forget the way you made them feel. Mm. And, you know, like you, I just, I love bringing the best out of people. I love making people feel like, you know, the, your best days are ahead of you. I want to thank all of our loyal fans that spread across all 50 states and 14 different countries. It's absolutely amazing. Folks, help us keep spreading the word, right? Share your favorite episodes with friends and make sure that you are liking and subscribing to The Hit Streak on all digital platforms. Thanks again, and we look forward to more. Even in marketing, we've, you know, we've dialed it down to two types of marketing informative and transformative and informative gives you a whole lot of information that you'll remember most of it or some of it and transformative marketing uh, p- means you made a person feel a certain way which they always remember how you made them feel right? right so we focus on how you make people feel i tell you this when i come up here and you have somebody in the parking lot waiting for me to show up like i instantly felt like okay this is different because you and i we've done a million podcasts yeah but you come here this place is different. You got a phenomenal group of guys here. They're the best. And it's all really about are. an experience, and they take a lot of pride in it. 
and they're really good at it. And um, the, it's a ble- it's a true blessing to get to hang out and work with them on a regular basis. Like totally, um, they pull a lot of weight. They pull a lot of weight, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. All right. So um, how'd you get into the NFL? Uh, the oh, the announcing. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's funny, man. Um, I'm sitting in a Chick Fil A drive through in. 21, 22, 23. So it would have been February of 21. And my wife sends me a screenshot of a Facebook post from the Tennessee Titans that said, Duke Donegan, PA announcer, retires after 20 years. Titans are holding open audition for their next PA announcer. So she sends me that screenshot and says, this is your job, babe. Go get it. Mm. Like, I believe in you or Mm. something like you cannot put an emphasis on a supportive wife like it's the game changer that's right so when my wife said i can go get it i'm gonna freaking go get it and i auditioned made the tape sent it in <clears throat> went out for the job and i'll never forget and this is a good tip for people out there on paper just like my football resume everybody was more qualified than me mm-hmm. everyone was better Like my PA announcing resume goes like this. PA announcer for his alma mater high school. I was a high school PA announcer for one game and I got fired. Okay. Like my own high school freaking fired me. (laughs) It's a hell of a track record, baby. (laughs) Seriously. I didn't tell them that at the time and I can joke about it now on the other side. But I'm going against guys like, I mean, dude. Stormy Warren, who's got the biggest, one of the biggest things on Sirius, he's got a resume. The announcer for the Tennessee Volunteers, announcer for the Los Angeles Kings, who just moved to Nashville. Shocker, someone from California moved out here, right? Yeah. So on paper, all of these guys are better than me. Like if you look at my resume, PA announcer, high school, got fired, like least qualified. But I was the last one to go and I listened to all of them and all of them did it the exact same way. Starting at running back, number 22, Derek Henry. And they did it in their own voice. But I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm not going to do it that way. They're either going to love me or hate me, but I'm going to do it my way. And so when I, and as a fan, because I've been a fan of the Titans ever since I was seven years old, my first Pop Warner team was the Oilers. And that's when I'm like, okay, I love Oilers. And they moved to Tennessee. I'm like, Titans. So I'm like, okay, the same way we would do it in the shower and army, like, if I had the opportunity to announce Derek Henry, how would I do it? So when I got my opportunity, I said, and that running back, your two-time NFL rushing champion, number 22, all hail King Henry. And like the whole thing was like, okay, well, that was different. And I ended up getting the job. And it was because they, when I stood in front of all my bosses, who are my bosses now, they said, you were different. And we need this stadium to have an energy and a spark plug that we've never had. Because the truth is, everyone loves coming to Nashville and visiting. We're right in the center of the country. We're the easiest stadium to get to from around the country. And our football team is typically average. And our stadium's not loud. So everybody, whether you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan, Packers, Bears, Lions, they all come to Nashville. So the stadium's always 60-40, the other fans. So... We need to turn this freaking thing around. And in three years, man, we have. And it's really fun to get that stadium rocking. My favorite, we ended up losing the game, which sucked. But we were the number one seed in the AFC my first year against the Cincinnati Bengals. And, dude, it was like – and Cincinnati is a five-hour drive, 30-minute plane flight. So it's super easy to get here. And, dude, it was like – 95% 95% Titans fans mm. and 5%. That place was rocking. Yeah. They just had Joe Burrow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but man, that play, it was just, it was phenomenal to see the turnaround in one year. I was like, thank you, Lord. Cause that was like something like he just gave his kid a good present. Cause he knows I love football. He's like, That's just a gift from God. Like saying like, Hey, Good job, son. You can have this. That's right. You know, that's, that's right. awesome. That is. That's, so that's, that's how I got killer. into it. Dude, that's awesome, man. That's a heck of a story. A heck of a story. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But um, all right. So since then, um, 
You've been you've been a busy busy boy. I want to talk about the uh, the hoodie you're wearing and uh, bringheaven.us. But but before we do, folks, check out uh, Matt Rogers online, mattrogersusa.com, and on Instagram at mattrogersusa. Um, let's talk about bringheaven.us. Yeah. All right. So, what was the inspiration behind it? The uh, the the story. And uh, I, I, honestly, man, I love the stinking logo. Like I'm gonna be buying some stuff today. I really appreciate that. We worked hard on this because I get. We had like wings above there and someone's like, what is it? A deer hunting thing? Like it looks like you're hunting moose because there was antlers on top. So I think I like the logo now. It's clean. The concept behind Bring Heaven is exactly like the way I was brought up. Like everybody thinks, you know, I'm a sinner. So Jesus came and died for my sins so I can go to heaven one day, which is true. But it's a fraction of the whole reason why he came like yes we have salvation through him yes if we were to die today we spend eternity with him and that is beautiful and the number one thing is like i love saving souls Mm -hmm. but at the same time because i've seen and i was taught at a young age and i believe now and see now it's like we are operating under an open heaven Mm -hmm. so when we get there there's not going to be cancer in heaven so it ought not be here. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be wheelchairs in heaven, so it ought not be here. But you know what else isn't going to be there? Depression, anxiety, gossip, backbiting. Uh, none of that exists in heaven. And, and the disciples asked him, how do we pray? And he says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, the same as it is in heaven. Mm. So That's the mandate from Jesus. So when I pray for somebody who's sick, I don't pray, God, if it's your will, please heal them. Mm. I already know it's God's will. That's right. Because I saw that in the life of Jesus. Every single person that came to him, he healed them. And um, and when I saw that in the guy that I'm following, which is Jesus, he said, go do the same things that I do. So that's what bring heaven means. Like when I show up to a place... I'm always trying to bring heaven and it doesn't always have to be. And it isn't always healing. Like sometimes you just smile at someone and say, Hey, you look really good today. You smell good today. Like, I mean, like just being kind to people changes the atmosphere. But I'll also tell you this, man, if, if, if someone's in some trouble, like, uh, I'll just give you an example. A buddy of mine who suffered a massive heart attack two days ago, And I just left his hospital room yesterday on ICU. Um, I don't believe it's God's will for my friend to die at 52 years old. He's got two sons. He's a phenomenal coach. His boys need him. His wife needs him. So when I go there and I pray, I'm bringing heaven. I'm releasing the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives inside of me out onto him. And I'm believing for that situation to turn around. Mm. So... And I've just seen it too many times. And I'll say this, and this is this is the tough part, is so like last Wednesday night, I spoke at a public school thing. I thought there was going to be 80 people there, but they heard that, oh, this guy that believes in faith and miracles coming, there ended up being 405 people there. there it was awesome in a high school gym. And I told my testimony for like 20 minutes, talked about Jesus the Savior and Jesus the Healer. So does anyone want to receive Christ, their personal savior? It was awesome. 55 people came forward, gave their heart to Jesus. Beautiful. Then I said, does anyone love Jesus? You're blood bought. You know, if you were dying, you're going to heaven, but you're struggling with something. You're struggling with anxiety. You're struggling with depression. And from the top corner, I see this kid. I wish, you know, you could see it. He waddles down, severely crippled from his waist down. Mm. Should have been on a walker cane, but I think, I think he's been so used to walking that way. It's just Mm -hmm. who he is waddles down comes up to me i said hey man i saw that you uh you also raised your hand for salvation man that's awesome he goes yeah and i go well what can i pray for you for it's like you know what i mean like and he goes and it was so sad he goes i want i want i want i want i want i want to play sports i've never been able to play sports and i want to play sports and you said that god can heal me so i want i want to be healed because i want to play sports so instantly i'm like God, you healed me. I wanted to play sports at five. You did it for me. You can do it for this guy. Mm-hmm. Real simple prayer. I don't, you know, smack people on the head. And be healed. Like, I don't do that stuff. Like, I saw that stuff growing up. Yeah. Kind of weird. Uh, but I, I'll tell you what I did do. I said a simple prayer. God, you love this boy. 
If you're anywhere in the area, I know that you would love to see him on a sports field. I pray that you touch his knees right now, touch his hips, bring healing in Jesus' name, because I know that's your will. Amen. Really simple. He gets this big smile on his face. He starts bending his knees, and he gets this big smile on his face. I go, I go how do you feel? He goes, man, I feel, I feel good. I'm like, good. I'm like, Let's kind of walk around. So he's walking maybe a little better, and he gets a big smile on his face, and he looks at me. He goes, I, I feel... I feel like I want to run. And I'm like, oh, crap. Like, my heart starts beating now. Yeah, like, yeah. All right, there's four people walking. I go, all right, bro, you want to run? I'll run with you. So, dude, I'm telling you, Nick, it was like the scene from Forrest Gump. Wow. When he's got the ankle brace on, he's waddling and running like a duck would run. And I'm telling you, in like 20 seconds, dude, his freaking knees get straight. And he starts sprinting and I start cheering and I go, let's go, let's go. And the whole gym is like going crazy. And dude, he is running straight. Oh my God. And I was just like, I mean, that just fires me up. Yeah. Dude, he freaking trips and flies through the air. Got to be about 10 feet. The first thing to hit the hardwood floor is his face. Mm. Bam. Pants go down to his ankles, tidy whities the whole gym. Oh, and dude, all I just remember saying, Jesus, like, and I sit, pray in my heart, like, God, help me. Like, what do I do here? Like, this is bad. And I look at him and God just said, just cheer him on, just cheer him on. The way people cheered you on, cheer him on. Mm-hmm. So I go, let's go, man. You're awesome. I go, you just freaking ate it in front of 400 people and you ran. I go, let's go. Get smile, pulls his pants up, freaking starts sprinting around the gym. The whole place starts going crazy. That boy walked out of there completely normal. Wow. And my buddy, like, it was phenomenal so you see that and you believe here's the tough part my mom who i've been bragging about this whole time she passes away from the very same sickness i saw her heal so many people of her god healed through her Mm -hmm. from her faith and this was in 2004 she passed away so from 2004 to 2000 and i'd say 10 I didn't see any miracles because miracles died with my mom. And then, and then in 2008, my second son's born. He's born with a rare genetic disease called cystic fibrosis. It's a chronic lung and pancreas disease. They said, there's no cure. He's never going to do this. He's never going to do that. He's going to be on a feeding tube. And I just remember my mom saying, it don't matter what you say. My Jesus is going to heal him. Mm-hmm. But I remember crying out to God with a sick kid. I was losing everything. I was broke. My wife was depressed, didn't leave the house for nine months. I mean, that's heavy. Like, you come visit the Rogers house in 2008, it freaking sucks. Mm. And I remember asking God, why did you say, by your stripes, we're healed, only to have my mom die? Why did you say that all things are possible to those who believe, only to have my kids sick with this diagnosis? And I'll never forget what he said to me, and it changed my life. He said, you're basing my character and nature off of what didn't happen with your mom and the death of your mom instead of what did happen with my son and the life of Jesus. Mm. Get your eyes off of what didn't happen with your mom. Put your eyes back on what did happen through Jesus, and I will change your life, and you will see unbelievable things. Mm. And it was at that time, April 9th, 2010, because my son was two years old, and it sucked. And I'm telling you, from 2010 to today in 14 years, I've just seen crazy, crazy things like the story I just told. And Mm. it's awesome. And what happens is, and I'll just be quiet on this one, is we judge the character and nature of God and miracles off of what doesn't happen more so than what does happen and what has already happened. Mm. And that's where I think we get jacked up with maybe he will, maybe he won't. Like the Bible says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We say, well, not everyone's going to be healed. Mm. It's not what he says. Mm. You know what I mean? And so it's those things because there's real problems and I've been through them, but it's something to where you have a promise from heaven, but you have a very real problem on earth. And when you're living between the promise and the problem, it keeps you totally dependent on God. Mm. That's right. So, I mean, Mm. that's kind of where bring heaven comes from right now. Right now, you know, we have some really cool clothes that I like. I like the logo. Uh, in the future, it's going to be conferences. I hate 
the word healing crusades because people have jacked that up and made it so ugly. Yeah. But here's the truth, man. I don't need anybody's money. I'm not trying to build a ministry or sell a book or anything like that. Like, dude, I just want to show up and love people and show them the real power of God. And I roll with some cats that really bring heaven. So that's where I see this going in the very near future um, of doing that and just bringing heaven everywhere we go. bro. Mm. The Hit Streak is powered by our partners at Hit Lab Creative Studios. Whether it's launching your brand new podcast, rebranding your current podcast, or taking advantage of any of their other content packages specifically for your social media needs, the Hit Lab is a one-stop shop for you. Visit hitlabstudio.com for more. I know everybody's unique, and I think that everybody gets a specific gift that God only gives them. And I right. think if they're not happy with their life, they're not using that gift. 100%. Right? You know, I think that, um, you know, I, I didn't know for a long time how to to really truly pray. Um, you know, I I was more of a I, I was wishing and calling it prayer. Right. You know what I mean? And and, and there's a difference. And um, you know, I've learned that. The struggle is where the gifts are. You know what I mean? That's because you wouldn't recognize light without dark. You wouldn't recognize good without evil. There's always got to be other side so that we know what it is that we're looking at. And a lot of times, maybe we, when we, you know, God didn't provide, well, like, how can we truly understand God's, God's path and, 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 and what he wants for us? Like we're humanizing him too much. Right. You know, and and that's um, so like you know, my wife and I were literally talking about this last night, where we had got in from a dinner, and we sat in the car for probably thirty minutes in the driveway, just talking about this. And um, it's just like the last probably two years, um, like even when I was after ball and I was in that struggle, and we go to church and and I had all these opinions. I'm like, you know, I should, you know, God's going to use me. My old pastor friend, Roger Patton says, Nick, um, you know, God called you into ministry. You just hadn't answered the call yet. And I was like, well, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but my, my heart and eyes are open. And, um, it, you know, it was like, I was telling you before we started recording this, um, I was, I played it really safe for a long time. And, and, and it was funny because all the, the goals and things that I had, I always got to, I always got as close to those as I was in my confidence and in, in speaking what was actually on my heart. And, um, it was more for my agenda than what God was pouring into me. And the moment that I changed that, all my fear went away. My confidence went yeah. through the roof. Um, and all of a sudden things are starting to, to work. I'm getting to hang with people like you that, you know, three years ago, I had no reason you, there was no reason, no value that I brought for you to hang. You know, it's crazy. It's all been it's all been through um, through faith, and everything that we found is the more I feed my faith, the more I'm feeding the rest of my life. Yeah, you know 100%. what I mean. Instead of feeding, and and a lot of people just feed fear. And as I started to get a real presence on social, I noticed too, like you know, at, there would be hundreds or thousands of likes and positive comments on a post, but the three negative ones were the ones that stuck out to me <laughs> that I focused on. And it was like, why am I giving the negative a microphone? Why am I giving it a megaphone? Why not give the positive part a megaphone? When 2020, when everything was so negative you saw on TV, yeah, when it really came out like that there's both good news and bad news, but all they're giving us is the bad news. It was like, that was when it all, 2020 was when it really started working on me. It was the, ironically, it was the time that I met Brad and saw his studio and realized, um, like at, to that point I had done zero videos on social media. All of our marketing was done with static images, like where we are today versus just three, four years ago, there's been 10 years of change in that three to four years versus, awesome. versus the 20 before that, you know what I mean? So the, um, the crazy thing I was going to say about that too is like that was always in you. That was always quote God's will. But had you not, had you not gone down that path and listened to fear or whatever, then you would be somewhere totally different. And people would say, "Well, that was God's will." Yeah. For your, it's like the Roman says, "Renew your mind so that you can prove the perfect will of God." Like. Mm. We're supposed to know what God's will is. Mm-hmm. How do you know what God's will is? Well, that's when, this is the most controversial for a lot of people who have different beliefs, that's when you look to the life of Jesus. Because Jesus told Philip, if you've seen me, 
you've seen the father. Mm. Nobody has seen the father except the son. So if you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at God. What did Jesus do? And I remember this was like five years ago. I prayed a very simple prayer. I said, Jesus, let me see people through your eyes. And dude, I promise you, Nick, I'm not just saying this. Like, dude, I don't get offended anymore. Like people right. can't offend me. Like I, I mean, certain situations I'll feel anger in this and that, but like, I don't get angry anymore. Like I used to, I used to be a mad, mad guy. Mm. Like I was very, very angry. Correct. I don't anymore. And it's just like, it's the ultimate game changer when you start seeing people through the lens of, of Christ. Like That's right. It, it really is. I also believe too, that like, you know, there's a story that my dad used to tell me all the time about, uh, you know, he was like, so there, this guy lives in a, in a suburban neighborhood and, and, and there's a, it rains and, you know, something happens and it's, it's flooded. Right. And he's trapped on his roof and he prays to God for a way out. And the guy sends, you know, God, a, a guy with a boat comes rolling down and says, Hey, you need help. He goes, no, no, God's got me. I'm waiting on God. <laughs> And then, you know, the next thing is a, a maybe a little bit of, um, a bigger boat, but then the last one's like a helicopter with the ladder. He's like, no, I got it. God's got me. And so God was basically answering his prayers, but he didn't recognize that it was being answered. I don't think God blesses you with anything you're not ready to receive. Right. You know, so if, um, you know, if you truly have, I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine the other night, and if you truly believe, if your faith is strong enough, and like, he, so there's, the long story short, my friend um, through a, um, through a relationship with uh, with his daughter's mother, they're separated, and he's fighting for his life to get his daughter back. Okay, so um, and there's a lot of finance needs that comes along with that when you have to go to court and everything else, right? So um, we're working, we're we're business partners um, in uh, in a company, and we're, honestly, we're working on some some deals that are bigger than any of us have ever touched, and they're like right there at the finish line. And he's kind of panicking a little bit, like if we don't get this deal, I'm not going to get my wife, my daughter back. Yeah. So on and so forth. And I was like, dude, where's your faith, man? Like, <laughs> right. you, you know what I mean? Like, think about what you're saying. I was like, dude, if you don't, if your faith is that uh, fractured, you're not ready to receive the blessing that's on the other side. Yeah. Right? So you're not, it's not going to happen. Like, dude, I was like, this, I need this deal too. <laughs> like, you know, so yeah. I was like, dude, but I know God's got us. And when we're ready, we're going to get it. Right. So I was yeah. like, why don't you, can you not just relax? Yeah. The timing of God is frustrating, but he's, Always on time, isn't he? That's right. And I want to say, like, the the person that said you need to get into ministry, who said you're not? That's exactly right. What is ministry? Like, That's exactly I, I don't right. got to be a pastor in a church. I've seen, I mean, I love, I love ministering in churches with people, but I love, love, love ministering outside of That's the right. walls. Because it's awesome. Like, And you and I were talking before we started recording, like, Growing up, I always looked at Christians from a financial standpoint, like they were weak. Like all the Christians I knew were freaking broke. And well, if God provides, if God wills, and this and that. And it's like, dude, your God is weak. Mm -hmm. Like, let's go. Like, let me tell you something. If God was in control the way we say he's in control, like, oh, well, God's in control of all the money. Well, then God has to explain why the porn industry has more money than the church. That's right. If God's really in control, why does the secular realm have more resources than the Christian realm? But like you and I were talking about, the Christian realm's finally waking up to what yeah. we really do have. He's more than a prayer to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. He supplies all of our needs. Like I think there's a pendulum shifting because there needs to be men and women of God in the workplace that have the resources to change the environment. Mm. Like everyone's like, Oh, well, Jesus was broke. He didn't have anything. Are you freaking crazy? That dude pulled money out of fish's mouth. Mm. Like he didn't lack anything. That's right. You know what I mean? So I just don't like this weak Christian thing to where like Christians are beggars or waiting on this God to show up. What's like, dude, he already showed up. Mm -hmm. Like heaven's answer is Jesus. There'll never be another one. And we have everything. Like we either can do all things through Christ or we can't, and that doesn't depend on him. It's what we believe. And I'll just say this, like there's the principles of Jesus that lead to prosperity, mm -hmm. and there's the person of Jesus that leads to peace. Mm -hmm. And I have, and you have a ton of friends that operate in the principles of Jesus, mm. and they have the prosperity, but they're freaking miserable. That's right. They're one bad day away from creating a you know, create or making or having suicide. That's right. Or one bad deal away from 
losing everything. That's right. So they have the principles, but they have no peace. And then I also have family members that have the person of Jesus, but don't practice the principles. So they have peace, but they're sitting on their couch waiting. Well, God's going to show up. Yeah. Well, God will bless me. It's like, how many handouts are you going to have to take from God's people before you actually show up and be one of God's people? That's right. So I like the way you roll principles and person because you can have all the wealth and all the peace. Like God's not offended. Well, you know, brother, it's harder for a rich person to enter in the kingdom of heaven than the eye through a needle. Yeah. Like don't be that guy. Yeah. It doesn't mean if you have it, you know what I mean? Like, and people always say, well, money's the root of all evil. Dude, that's not what the Bible says. It says money is a root of evil, not the root of all evil. Money is a root of evil. Mm. So if money owns you instead of you owing it, yeah, dude, that's that's evil. Mm -hmm. But if you give someone like you and your wife $100 million tomorrow, it ain't going to all be spe spent on food, cars, and wine. You're going to give it away. That's like, right. So the more we make, the more we give. Yeah. A pastor told me that. He said, dude, everybody can give their time. Not everybody can give their money. And the church does have to have money. 100%. The church does have to have money. And money, like, it's like Brad always says, money's just a tool. He told me that one time. He said, dude, if you're a bad person, you get a lot of money, you're a it'll make you a worse person. But if you're a good person and you get a lot of money, it'll make you a great person. <laughs> and I was like, that's pretty fact. Like, that's awesome. 100%. You know? Um, so, one of the things that's been on my heart big time lately, and something that I've been talking to a, um, a lot of pastors about, churches, um, and, uh, and and just and just people of faith, is um, giving a voice to your voices, right? Giving a voice to your voices. Yeah. And you just mentioned, you know, the this. I used to not be able to listen to Christian music or even watch faith based movies because the production was so bad. Dude, it, it was like we right? just, you know, we, like you just, how bad can we make <laughs> it? How cheap can we make it? And 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 let it work. So, but that's I feel hey, like God that's bless better. him. But how many Kirk Cameron movies can we watch, and then we all have Chick Fil A at the end? It's like, yay! Like, yeah. Come on, give me give me something. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, the you know, so what's been on 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 my heart is is um, we were talking about it before is you know um, people are spending so much time on their devices every day looking at a screen, and that's the one place that you find the, the like that's where where you find God the the least is is on the screen like this is this is the devil's tool right. you know not but it doesn't have to be and um and and this is again give a voice to your voices you have the power to share immediately you have the power to reach people immediately on these devices and it's something that like i feel like this is for 2024 this is a big message and theme for me and all of my keynotes yeah. are based around this and i'm even i'm any church that will let me go in and educate their elders and their staff on how to leverage these devices and social media and whatnot for the good. It's um, I I'll go talk to any one of them anytime um, because the numbers do add up and it does work. And we've proven that in business, even this podcast alone, when I started this podcast, it was not what was like, you could probably listen to the first 50 episodes. We might not mention your faith at all. And now it's probably two thirds of the episodes. And people right. ask me, was well, this a religious podcast? No, it's a faith based podcast. Yeah. My whole life's faith based. So if it's, if I'm in it, it's faith based. Yep. You know, and um, it's a business podcast that's faith based that tells stories. <laughs> you know, totally. That's what it is. Um, so it's, it's evolved just like I have and just like everybody else has. But Matt, what, what advice do you have? Because I feel like we're going to do something together on this. I don't know what it is yet. Yeah. But um, what advice do you have to bring heaven to these devices? Well, the number one thing is put good content out there, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and when you put good content out there, they're going to watch. And if they watch, then they will come. You know, people will come. Build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you said it best off camera. It's you have these old school preachers and pastors, which nothing against them. I'm just making a point on this one point. These old school preachers and pastors that have done it one way for so long. And well, this is the way God did it. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, he's a pretty creative God and he's going from glory to glory and he's constantly changing. Like, why are we putting God in a box from 1970 and 1980? Like, dude, it's 2024. People ain't going to your dead church anymore, mm -hmm. but they're right here. And like you said, I can find anything on my phone, but it's very hard to find solid, powerful words mm -hmm. from the church, from God. 
um, and we're missing the mark. And what's really happening, what's in my opinion, what's really going to hurt is Gen Z Mm -hmm. because those kids are the technology Mm -hmm. kids. Like those kids at 14 to 19 are way smarter than we were at 14 to 19. Yep. Way smarter. Exposure. Yep. And we're not reaching them. 50% 50% of pastors are quitting every day. This mm. is a very alarming statistic. 50% of pastors are quitting every day. Youth groups are down 40% from what they were 10 years ago. Mm. So there's 40% less youth groups, 50% less pastors. They're calling Gen Z the lost generation. Mm-hmm. So we have a youth group out of our house that has turned it from six kids. Our last one, we had 93 kids. Wow. It's awesome what God's doing. I asked them, I said, all right, I'm just doing a survey. How many of you go to church, love your youth group, and love going to church? Raise your hand. Out of 93 kids, how many think raise their hand? Mm, mm, All of them, right? Three. Three? Three Mm. out of 93. Mm. How many of you read your Bible on a regular basis? Mm. Three. Wow. So my point is, they're all right here. They ain't going to your church. So you said it best off camera. Jesus said, go into the world. Not wait for them to come to you. You go. Well, how do we go nowadays? Right here. Yeah. Because this is where they are. We need to go to people. Jesus meets you where you're at. God meets you where you're at. Where are they at? They're alone. They're depressed. They're lonely. They're anxious in their room by themselves looking at their screen. Why don't you freaking go to them? Mm -hmm. Put something out there. Use your resources that you've used for the mission trips to Haiti and to Gaza and all this stuff. Put it towards technology and reach these kids in our backyard Mm. because they're starving for God. They're starving. And when they show up, I mean, and, and then they will come to you. Go to them. They'll come back to you. People will always return to where they feel loved. Mm-hmm. So you bring love, you bring heaven through your phone, they will come to you. Mm. So if you're listening to this and you're not doing that in your church, you are missing the mark. And just ask yourself, in the last 10 years, has your church grown without yeah. social media or has it gone backwards? I mean, there's your answer because yeah. we all know the definition of insanity. The hit streak is powered by Team Hyder. Team Hyder has been serving you for 11 years and has racked up over 20 national and local awards for excellence in all areas. When it comes to finding the right health plan, we need to consider your family's needs and your family's budget. That's what we do to serve you. To look further and to book an appointment, visit teamhyder.com. Again, it's just something that is um, it's so powerful. And, and like the, the example that I use all the time. So the church that we attend here in Brentwood, you know, three three fifty on average Sunday in the congregation, and um, and 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 the church that we attend, uh, New Hope in Brentwood, is uh, their eyes are open way more than than most, and that's why we can why we can go there. And and honestly, uh, Pastor Josh Heisman is an a- unbelievable man and human being and leader. It's awesome. And. Um, but um, and and we've talked about this many times, and I almost called him on the way home on Monday because it was like God was yelling at me, and I was like, I got to talk to somebody about this. I need help. <laughs> and so, like, I've always gone, to, or since I met Roger Patton in 2013, I started going to my pastor for help, right? And it's like, you know, why do people go to to Nick Heider or Grant Cardone or Tony Robbins or Brad Lee? It's because well, those guys are represented here. Yep. Not, but the pastors ain't. Yep. You know, so imagine if the pastors were here too. Um, and, and the, but again, the power of giving a voice to your voices, imagine 350 people in a congregation, right? And the pastor says, get out your phones, go to new hopes, Instagram, and go to the most recent clip that we uploaded this morning. And I want you to, everybody to share it right now, but then I want you to think of five people that you can, that this, that needs to hear this message and just, and you can, there's an option in Instagram to send it as a text message. Just send it, say, Hey, I saw this and thought of you, you know? And and that's going to go out to 350 people, right? Or, or to uh, 350 people are going to send it to five people. Mm-hmm. So you can do the math on top of the shares like that. There was a, I watched the We Are the World documentary, yeah, the uh, uh, last week, and I, I forgot that they did this when they released the song. All the radio stations in the world stopped what they were doing and played it at the same time. That's cool. I didn't know that. Why can't we do that? Why? 
Why? Why? We all have a network. You don't have to rely on, you have to get the radio stations to do it. I don't know how they accomplished that. All those radio stations all over the place, stopping and playing it at the exact same time on all the radio stations. Well, dude, how many people could we all, again, the power of numbers give a voice to your voices. Yep. Imagine if 10, 10 churches all did the same thing at the exact same time or 100 churches where they said, everybody send this to five people. And how many thousands or tens of thousands or even uh, hundreds of thousands of people that you could reach like that. And yeah. then imagine if you did it again the next day and the next day and the next day. That's called a movement. <laughs> yep. And it's a big one. And it's a really good one. So like, you know, it's it's I, in my opinion, I think it's that easy. No, it's a, a perfect example would be, for those of us who have heard of it, the Asbury Revival, what it was, a year ago, right? Asbury yeah. University? Mm -hmm. Is that my standard? It was Asbury, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason that got big was because everyone was talking about on social media. So a ton of more people started going there and it lasted longer because they got the message out on the phone. You're hundred percent right. The church is missing the mark on social media. It's just, it's a unbelievable tool where um, it, it's, we all use it just not for that, for whatever reason. And I, but I feel like that's about to change. Yeah. Um, and it's something that like, um, you know, I've, again, I'll be the guy that, that takes the shots in the back for it. If that's what it takes, because, um, Again, I was having so many conversations at the National Prayer Breakfast with pastors there about this exact same thing. And within five minutes of me just talking to them and explaining to them just a conversation like we just had, they were like, we haven't thought of it that way. Yeah. You know? And I was like, cool. Well, how can I help? How can I help? Because if you go back there with this, you're going to be the one take, getting shot in the back. I'll do it. I'll get shot in the back. Yeah. And then you can take it and run with it, you know? So, um, I mean, I, I could stay on this. All dang day, but this is about this is about you and everything no, that's working in you, man. So um, obviously, folks, we're with Matt Rogers, MattRogersUSA.com on Instagram at MattRogersUSA. Um, BringHeaven.us is where you can check out. Uh, yeah, honestly, man, like seriously, my wife and her shop and I are shopping today. Love and you, man. Um, thank you. And uh, and and I'll be I'm gonna be rocking that stuff like crazy. I need to hook you up with too with uh, my buddy Chris Hine, who's up in Minnesota. I think he's changing the game in uh, in in merchant and promotional items, especially just, just because yes. he's got best stuff, the best stuff. He's got be different stuff that I've never seen before. I'll show you the flight jacket. You remember the flight jacket Brad had on at the Christmas yes, party? Yes, that's that, it. That came from Chris. Oh, dude, he's uh, high quality. He's he ain't making sweatshirts, is he? He's yeah. making it's like yeah, it's it's high end. Yeah, and he um and he made he brought me a flight jacket yesterday. Actually, he brought one for me, Rhiannon, and Ethan, and a hoodie for my daughter. That had that's all, sick. Hit streak stuff on it. The uh, all the staff was wearing their hoodies yesterday. Um, it's a it's a brand I'd never heard of before. It's just different, and it's like the best quality stuff I've ever made. I'm gonna connect you guys today. That'd be um, awesome. He's in Thank Nashville you. right now. He, oh, they fly back cold. tomorrow. Um, they fly back tomorrow. But uh, great dude. And and whatnot, but anyways, there's just so much stuff working. Like, what's what's on what's on the horizon for you? What's next? What can we do together? What can we help out on? Like, what's on your heart, man? I just, I mean, I have what's on my heart is Gen Z is this generation. They're calling it the lost generation. So um, we're you know meeting max capacity because it started at our house with in 2020 April 2020. My son goes, Dad. He was a freshman at the time. He's a senior now. He goes, Dad, a couple of my buddies have Bible questions. They see you post about Jesus on your Instagram. Can they come over? So like three kids came over in April of 2020 when we all thought we were going to die if we brought an Amazon box in the house. And three kids sat in my backyard. And then the next week it turned into, you know, more and more and more. And now we're at over 90 kids. And mm. I got Elijah Molden from the Titans coming to speak next week. Oh, wow. So I know we'll have well over 100 kids. And then I got my boy. I got to hook you up with him. His name is Rex Crane. He's out of California. He's coming. And when, when he comes, man, that guy just carries a different anointing. So I think we're going to start getting towards 150 to, you know, by the summer, we'll probably have 200 kids. So that's on my heart is I'm looking to really, really bring the truth to this lost generation because they are starving. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's something that we're doing. So anything, anyone that can partner with us on that, that is the call on my heart right now, because man, our kids are dying spiritually and physically hmm. because, you know, every single week we have at least five kids come up that say, I was thinking that suicide was a better option. Hmm. And because I came tonight, I'm not going to take my life. Hmm. So they're lost, man. And we have the answer. That's right. We that's, have the answer. That's exactly right. And, um, you know, literally just what you're talking about with, I mean, when we were in 
DC, that was when all the stuff had on, was happening on Capitol Hill where they were talking about all the kids that have committed suicide from the stuff, the exposure to the devices and whatnot, you know? So, I mean, like it's, it's, it's all over us. Those kids, like you said, if, if those kids that took their life, they're watching something on there that makes them feel like they're missing out on something that they're not good enough. They didn't make it. They mm-hmm. didn't quite. And they're calling it quits. What if they saw something that gave them an answer? Hey, I know your feelings right now, but let me tell you about this guy named Jesus mm-hmm. and what he did. Mm-hmm. Not the religious figure that we, this dogmatic, but dude, this guy that really did come to the earth as a man, this mm-hmm. guy that really did die for you, and this guy that really did raise from the dead. Yeah. And now he put that inside of you for you to go crush things. Yeah. Like it it changes the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm with you. We got to put that message out and get it in front of Gen Z. Um, and we're doing that, but you know, you always want to go faster and bigger. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was having a, a conversation. Um, ben and I were talking about this um, earlier this week, literally. And it's there's a lot of folks that um, out there that are struggling um, spiritually, mentally, um, you know, controlling the uh, um, it, basically just having a hard time giving negativity the megaphone and not all the great things in their life. And um, and I, w- I challenged um, I challenged Ben. I was like to challenge other people, like, dude, if if you're going to church and like so, first of all, the fr- I figured out for me that if I'm using if I'm using church properly for me, I'm gonna like that's where I go to refuel every week because when I come back on the next Sunday, I'm empty. I burned it all. I went as hard as I could go, and I'm coming back to refuel, like you know what I mean, repurpose. Mm-hmm. And and my um, I learned this when I went to Treveca. When I left, I had a I was at um at about ten years where I didn't want to go to church because. One, I felt like I was forced to do so. Well, that, now obviously, I went to that school and I should have known. Like, but that's young Nick was dumb and and whatnot. But there was a, a lot of Nazarene young, Nick, yeah, Nazarene <laughs> Nick. But there was a lot of young kids in there um, that were my age that would be in there and dude, they were holier now for that hour. And then as soon as they'd leave, yes. I was like, it just seemed so hypocritical at the time. It hurts. And I see, I see all these um, when I go to church. I have a hard time going to churches where where people are. Um, they're there, and it's they're there because it's what they do on Sunday, not because of the reason that they originally went. And you have to find uh, like the motivation wears off, right? So like, and that's where the discipline comes in, dude. Like you're listening to somebody that was called to give you a message. Like every time Pastor Josh speaks, I feel like I'm the only one there, and that's that's a place where I have to be able to get to. But then more importantly, if you're struggling, like there's some people that are going to church three and four and five days a week that are struggling with their thoughts. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you're going to the wrong place. <laughs> like, you know, change the scenery. Like, come on, man. Like, you right. know what I mean? You're not you're not getting what you need out of there. Doesn't matter if you like the people or not. It's not working. And my challenge is and it's something that my my wife and and my 14-year-old son do and we'll do with our daughter when she gets old enough. But like, I, as soon as church church is over, we get in the car, what'd you get out of the sermon and how are you going to apply it to your life this week? The application is missing. Yes. From churchgoers. They go because it's what they do on Sunday. Right. And it stops right there and they go, they leave and they feel good. And after lunch, they're right back to whatever it is that in and the regularly scheduled programming of their life. Yep. And they're not using the words that was given to them. I'm not saying it's everybody. And some people might pick and choose. Like, you know, there's the Easter the Easter sermon. They might get a little more out of that one. The Christmas story. Um, everybody's got their chapters of the Bible that I like the most, that are the most interesting and whatnot. But like, how do you do it every Sunday, every 52 weeks a year, 365 days a year? It's it's that intentionality right. that's missing. And it's some, that's another thing that's that's on my heart big time, you know, is if you're if you're struggling, like Again, how do you fill up that tank so that you can go burn it all the next week and then fill it up again the next the next Sunday? And I actually had a whole bunch of notes for this. I call it grounding grounding yourself in faith is what I talk about all the time. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is um, th- so here's a couple things. Check this out. So first of all, quitters lack clarity. <laughs> yeah. Um, instead of having a to do list, work on a to be list. That's gold right there. Yeah. I'm gonna have to give you quote credit today when I post that. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Genius is not enough. It takes courage to change people's hearts. Yes. You know, this is all the stuff I got from the prayer breakfast in DC, which by the way, um, we go to the prayer breakfast and we come back with hope. 
You're you taking me and my wife next year, right? Yeah, we are. Let's go. We are. Um, and um, I, I think that, you know, the church is redefining what courage, confidence, and strength means right now to the, to to society through through these devices. So um, again, I could stay on this all day long. Um, I feel like we got work to do and whatnot. Um, but uh, bringheaven.us, folks, like we need a... Um, and and I wanted I wanted to ask you this, Matt, because we used to give out it back in the day thousands of Team Hider T shirts. We were in the insurance space, yeah. And I just wanted I, I'm a, I'm a sports guy, so you can't be a member of a team without a jersey, right? So we wanted to give everybody a jersey that stood for something, yeah, right. And it was just our logo on a T shirt. We gave them out for free, and all I asked with it in every box there was a letter from me that basically said, "Hey, you know, you can't be a that welcome to the team. This is your jersey. All that I ask for this shirt." Is that any ch- any chance you get when you wear it? Take photos of yourself wearing it wherever you're at, and use these hashtags so we can find That's it. That's cool, you know. And I ended up getting pictures of team people wearing team hider shirts in front of ever like the the great, great wonders of the world all over the all over the world in front in beaches in front of the Eiffel Tower, Statue of Liberty, in front of the pyramids. It was awesome. We were it was That's trending so on Twitter cool. for a little while. That would be I told Heine that uh, Heine that yesterday when he was in because they get they give some really cool stuff away, and I was like, dude, just make sure you include an ask in there. Yep. When you do that, what is the ask for everybody that wears Bring Heaven? It's very very similar. We put a little welcome card in there as well, and I want to. My only ask is I want to see you. I want to see you wear it because one thing, like at the end of the day, look it. It's just sweatshirts, hoodies, and t-shirts right now. But one thing I pride myself on in the quality, and you and your wife will love it, it's is good stuff. Like mm-hmm. it's very, very comfortable. Um, and so that's one thing that they know that they're getting is they're getting a comfortable sweatshirt. Like this isn't gonna fade in a year after you wash it 20 times. But same thing. I want to see people, I, and I say, like, send us a photo of where you're bringing heaven mm-hmm. and what you're doing. So they do the hashtag bring heaven and it's that's so right. it's the same thing. I just want I want to see you in our stuff. Like it fires us up, and then we put our mission statement in there, and how we're bringing heaven to struggling teens that are on the verge of calling it quits, and it just fuels us and empowers us to just reach more. Mm. You know what I mean? Like we have the vision and we have the roadmap, so the road is paved. Now we just need the fuel, aka money, yep. to get there. So those partnerships, those people, when you support this, you know you're supporting teens. We like need- I, I didn't do this to make a million dollars, right? right? You know, but but we do need a million people taking a picture 100%. and putting it online, yeah. driving people to that website to see that message. Yes, sir. Boom. Um, dude, Matt, I could hang out with you right? all, all day long. And uh, honestly, man, you've turned into one of my favorite people. Oh, Bro, let's go. I'm serious. I'm serious. Tell Dale. Tell the team. That's right. I made the wall of fame. That's right. <laughs> Well, dude, as we bring this sucker to a close, is there any is there any final messages or anything else that uh, that uh, that you want to mention to everybody? Lord, what would you have me say? I would say that Jesus is so much more than a get out of jail free card. Mm. He's so much more than just a prayer to get to heaven. He's a provider. He's a healer. He's a savior. He's a king. He ain't a president. He ain't a politician. He's a king. And when you operate under the kingdom mandate, you live a kingdom lifestyle. Like we're supposed to be kings and priests, which is why I'm a brag about you, which is why I love walking in here. When you walk in here, you don't see a ton of Jesus stuff. And that is fine because this is a business atmosphere. What you are going to see is a bunch of freaking winners on the wall awards, accomplishments on how God has blessed this place with an abundance, with prosperity. So now you can introduce Jesus to someone. There's something very relatable about a wealthy man who is sold out for Jesus Mm. versus a broke, desperate man that's trying to preach about a Jesus Mm. that isn't broke. It's Mm. like, wait, if your king ain't broke, why are you freaking broke? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, Mm. I mean, like, dude, I'm created in the image of God. And God's not a loser, so I shouldn't be either. Dang. I couldn't. That's that's a sound bite right there, <laughs> dog. That's a good one. Um, and that might be a heck of a title for a book or a, a keynote or something, man. That's good. That, go. That's really good. I'm sure you know the publisher. Hook it up. Let's write it. That's happening, baby. That's right. <laughs> well, folks, we're hanging out with uh, Matt Rogers, PA announcer for the ten for your Tennessee Titans. Let's go. That's right. Um, and uh, TV show personality, motivational speaker, business owner, 
operating a 501c3, right? Oper- uh, the nonprofit and all those things. Yes. Like, dude, um, congratulations on everything so far. Congratulations Thank on your you. on your big and beautiful family who I had the pleasure to meet at the Christmas party. Um, oh, man. You know what I mean? So um, I don't know, man. This is um, It's a beautiful life. Yes, sir. That's all I know is it's a beautiful life. And um, if you're, for those of you out there that, that are struggling, like you wouldn't recognize the blessing if you didn't go through the struggle. So you got to push on through. And it's like the bison that, that, you know, they go through the storm instead of running away from it because they spend least the least amount of time in it, you know, because they're going through it. Right. So I like that. That's what you got to do, man. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, look at, dude, just, you know, when you're a Christian, doesn't mean everything works out. Like, it doesn't mean like everything is easy. Like, we still go through the same struggles, like the same win falls on us. I love what Jim Rohn said. The same wind falls on us all, hmm. and it's not the blowing of the wind; it's the setting of the sail. Hmm. When you set your sail towards God's kingdom, you just go through things differently than someone who would. Hmm. You go through cancer differently. You go through poverty differently. You go through a relationship struggle differently. You just live with a different perspective, hmm. and um, we win. <laughs> Life is fair. Everybody's price is just different. Let's go, dude. That's right. The hit streak is powered by Rack Financial. When it comes to your credit card merchant processing, Rack Financial is efficient, reliable, and trusted. At the end of the day, when it comes to processing your credit card payments, they make it simple, the way it's supposed to be. Check out Rack Financial. Well, folks, we've been hanging with Matt Rogers. Um, you can find him online at mattrogersusa.com and on Instagram at mattrogersusa, as well as uh, bringheaven.us. Yeah, baby. Right? That's the URL. So, Matt, dude, thanks so much for, for the hang today. You know, I, you know what's crazy? Normally, this sheet is full of handwriting and notes. Bro, I didn't write a thing today. We just went. Like, I, I is that a good thing or a bad thing? Spirit-led, bro. That doesn't mean like I gave you tweetable moments like, oh, man, I got to write that down. Dude, no, it was like I didn't have time to write it down. <laughs> And I'm always writing things down because I'm like, oh, I got to remember to go there and that and that. Dude, this one was totally just spirit led. It was awesome. It was awesome. Well, folks, thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of The Hit Streak. I am your man, Nick Heider. God bless.